Bonjour Jamie Little. Bonjour. Uh, so we had Jim. Now we have Jamie Little. That means yes. that uh, the next album is going to be Jamie Little Dale. Possibly or Jam. Jam. You know to create the Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis. You know <laughs> the trilogy. Who knows, man? It's true. Uh, I mean, is this this title? I mean, uh, means that uh, uh, it means something in particular. Like, like uh, it's not that before it was not being true to yourself, but does it have a certain? Uh, Yeah, it's 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 weird. I mean, to be honest, the story is not as dramatic as it could be. It's more <laughs> like I was trying to find the correct name for the album. I had some ideas and um, some song names and uh, things that maybe I might do normally to find a solution. <laughs> I don't like finding the title for the album. I find it quite a strange thing, you know. Uh, but... Um, Anyway, it didn't come naturally with this album. I was finding it hard. So someone that I was working with at the time was saying, well, why don't you just call it, you know, Jamie Liddell? And I was like, no, you can't do that. Like and then Beatles. I was like, yeah, and I was like, <laughs> why, why can't you do that, though? And then and I could never find a good answer why I couldn't do it. So mm. after a while, I was like, okay, we're going to do it. You know, it was like, like that, because I knew that I needed to come back after Compass with something kind of ambitious and focused, And I think I really did it with this record. So, um, in a way, it's a new start. It is a new start, so, you know, in terms of just kind of where I'm at and where I've come from. You know, there's always an opportunity to, uh, you know, plant the seeds again for the do, new season. Do you think your music in terms of albums? It's weird that, yeah. Uh, I mean, like I, a novel ultimately, or? I do kind mm. of, yeah. I mean, I don't know if I if I if I really agree with the way that that happens, especially in this digital age. We could have a subscription. There's probably lots of people tried all kinds of different ways mm. to stop doing albums, you know, because, for example, this album was finished some a long time ago, actually. You know, so it takes a long time for the label to do it, the press to catch up, and you know, for the whole machine to be like, and finally, we have this release. You know, whereas in the studio, the music is fresh. I could be like a bakery, you know, I could be making some really fresh, you know, product and just like put it on the shelf and just go, yeah, come and get it, you know. But there's something about that way of working that is maybe a tr troublesome. So I think the album concept is still potent. It's that uh, things important to focus your menu from time to time as a restaurant. What was on your roadmap for this uh, album? You said I wanted to go something. I mean, but do you, when you start an album, do you have like uh, it's directions? It's just like little seeds. It's uh, or you really know exactly where you want to go? Or do you are you mm. like in, when you're in the studio? Are you like a, a mad professor in uh, in a laboratory <laughs> experimenting stuff and trying? Mm. Yeah, kind of. Uh, I, I'm definitely sound Orient heavy. Mm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, sometimes just plugging in, for example, this album's a lot of drum machines, a lot of old vintage drum machines, uh, uh, which I'm really a fan of. And I've never actually had these machines, so that, that was new. Uh, and also the keyboard's pretty new to me. I, I had one on the last album, Compass, but I also got two new ones. <laughs> and they were very central to the way this album sounds and, and feels, you know. So sometimes when you just go over to a keyboard and just play a chord, and you, you kind of start to dream, you know, with the sound. And it kind of inspires you to write a certain thing. Same with the drum machines. You make a little beat and like it, and that just makes you sort of think of a song. Sometimes you think of a song when you're doing the washing up. Sometimes, you know, when you're going running or something, you have an idea. Ideas come in lots of different ways for me. I don't, I, I don't really have like a, you know, a strategy. Like I want to do an album just like this. I want this song, I want this song. I kind of, I do. I mean, I took my time with this record. It's, it's taken me a couple of years, uh, but I just kind of allowed the musical process to kind of evolve naturally, really. You you moved me. to Nashville what two, mm -hmm. two years ago and uh, yeah um, and you talked about like uh, instruments and uh, sounds and all that that uh, maybe 
It's going to show people that uh, there was a time when, like, country musicians, for example, and uh, soul, deep soul yeah. uh, musicians were, like, playing the same instruments and yeah. sometimes were in the same studios. Yeah, absolutely, you know. I mean, uh, I, I still want to do the tour of the Nashville studios, you know, RCA, yeah. these great places. Did, yeah. There's a lot of yeah. amazing ones there. And um, yeah, the heritage is, is really impressive, actually, sometimes with Nashville. It becomes, sometimes I'm amazed just the kind of people that are around. For example, I had a microphone, a very nice microphone that I, uh, I dropped. Uh, which was a disaster, but um, I had it repaired by this interesting guy that was Frank Zappa's technical assistant for years. Real character, real you know, American maniac. He slams the microphone down on the table, and I was like, ah, you know, that's what you're doing. He just pulls it apart. He had the heart of the microphone. This guy walks in, real friendly southern dude, and he's like, Hey, you know, what's going on, Arthur? You know, anything new? And like, they were talking for a while. He says hello, very friendly guy. Off he goes. And then I asked, uh, like, who is this guy, you know? And um, he, he wrote some songs for Aretha Franklin, you know, Muscle Shoals. He wrote, like, Do Right Woman. He wrote, like, I'm Your Puppet. What's, what's his name? Um, Mr. Penn. Ah, Dan Penn. Dan yeah, Penn. Yeah, he's an amazing songwriter. I met Dan Penn that day. Yeah, okay. I didn't know who he was. He just walked right up to me in Nashville. He lives up the road. He has his little home studio, you know. So there you go. I mean, a classic example of soul, country, heritage, mm. and it's right there in Nashville. And that kind of thing happens much more. Mm. I thought it was a joke, you know, like, yeah, we're gonna meet all these people, but you but, do, yeah. you actually do. It's interesting because uh, when we listen to your music, even if it sounds very contemporary, when we, can feel the influences of like old soul and funk. It's more like soul and funk from the 80s, like what was mentioned, like Prince or yeah, Michael yeah. Jackson. But all this uh, soul, earlier soul, the one you mentioned, mm -hmm. like Deep Soul and all that, influenced yeah. you during your uh, musical education? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, um, I, I mean, I was never like a big record collector, you know? Mm -hmm. But for a time when I lived in uh, in Bristol, when I went to university, I was living with a guy who was a really massive record collector. And that was a good time for me because he really taught me a lot about the rare grooves, about like, you know, all kinds of old soul, all kinds of like, basically he, he kind of opened up an entire book of like funk to me, mm. a funk book. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm still a student of the funk, you know, mm. that's kind of how I, I've, I've realized that I'm just that really. And uh, so, yeah, I like to, you know, hang around and, and, and educate myself in stages. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I didn't like it when people would give me more than one record for Christmas. I just wanted to have one, just one good record. That's all I want just so that I can really like absorb it and really listen to everything, every bass line, every little sound, you know? I wanted to like, if you have like 10 records, 20 records on there, all on your table and you're like, oh, I listen to one. You only have a superficial understanding. So that's a problem of today, no way. Yeah, with, uh, really, <laughs> internet it is. And all that. Less like, is more, man. You get yeah. some really heavy shit and just mm. really like <sighs> go crazy with it, you know? That's what I did a lot. What were these uh, Christmas records that uh, ah. went directly through your DNA? Yeah, I mean, there was a few. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, one of the, one of the big ones was uh, Marvin Gaye, you know, what's going on, you know, for a lot of people. But mm. for, uh, funny that one for me, a lot of the records that would be like that, I didn't enjoy them in the beginning, like Can, for example, Tago okay, Mago, I had that record. Because at school there were some hip kids who like dressed really well and I was kind of intimidated by them and I was like, hey, hey man, um, like, like what's cool? And they were like, all right kid, just listen to Tago Mago, you know, understand that and maybe we can talk. So I was like, all right. So I went off and I got Tago Mago and I started to smoke weed and walk around the block when in my mum's house, you know, I was like, and then I would put the headphones on and listen to Tag Omega and I will just be like scared shitless. I just would be confused and worried. <laughs> and um, it was amazing really to think about it because at that time sound would really affect me, you know, like I could get scared. 
I could get like, like my heart would go crazy with certain sounds and combinations, you know. Nowadays, it would be quite difficult, I think, for a sound to really hit me and take me like that, you know. But at the same time, now what I have is really the thing I look for, I guess, is the goosebumps, you know. The moments when you see the four top singing with Aretha Franklin, a very, you know, intimate setting, and they're just singing around a piano, and, you know, you just feel the pure music. Mm. And that gives me the rush, you know, in a different way. But yeah, can take Omega. There's a riot going on. What's going on? These big albums, Coltrane, obviously Miles Davis, albums that in a way become cliches because they're so like iconic, but they deserve to be. You know, they they they're huge. So you have your own studio now in uh, in Nashville. Yeah. When you're it's the first time that uh, you Home have your studio. tool mm -hmm. next to you. Uh, it's like that, yeah. That's is it, does amazing. it have an impact on the way you think your music, the way you write your music, you do recording music? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, just to have, yeah, I mean, the very fact, here we are in a place, we have lights, we have cameras, we have microphones, everything set up. Mm. I can leave, someone else can come in and we can you keep going. You know, if every time you have to do something, you have to pack down, mm. you have to wait, m make it again, you know, just for your mind, you're already stressing, you know about how to do things. You don't think about what could be better in the setup, how it could improve you know, an existing thing. So now I have a bit more of a permanent installation. I can say, yeah, I wish the sound in the room was a little bit better. Maybe we can improve that. I wish like, I had just like, a way to do this. And then I work on details, which make the flow better. And I've also had a really good time just producing for other artists. I did two albums whilst I made my album for up and coming artists that, um, that I've been working with. So um, it was a really productive time, you know. And during that time, I worked out how to record in the house because everything was recorded in the house in this new album. I did the drums, all the acoustic stuff as well as the synthetic stuff was recorded in the house. I never left the house. Mm. So it's, uh, you know, it's kind of Nashville house music. It's <laughs> like a new weird genre that I'm trying to like push. You can wake up at three in the morning and yeah, do stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's it. And also, I, not, I don't disturb my wife because the studio is a little separate and the neighbors never complain. It's, it's, a, it's a miracle. It's, it's great. You, you moved a lot uh, in, in your life, like um, England, Paris, Berlin, New mm -hmm. York, etc., etc. Yeah. Uh, all this uh, sound, because there's like sound stick to some cities, has yeah. impact on the way you, you think your music, you think? Yeah, it definitely does. It, it's something hard for me to make into in, into anything really tangible, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it's more the tempo of the city that has the most impact on me. You know, in, in New York, everything is moving quick. It, you kind of, uh, there's a demand for you to be like, yeah, what do you want? You know, what do you want to drink? You, you know, every, everything is like, next, next. So in, in your mind, you're like, um, you speed up. So coming from Berlin, Berlin is really lazy. Like, yeah, man, I'll see you at 11 o'clock. We have a breakfast long. You know, just maybe we'll do something later, you know. And in New York, it's like choppy. So I think I became part of the flow of the city and, and my music became, I, I got it together really quickly. And uh, in Nashville, like, it's a much, it's a slower tempo, but it's an ambitious place in a weird way. It's kind of, it's growing and changing as a city. Like hipsters are coming in, coffee mm. shops, nice little boutiques are slowly, you know, you can feel it. Mm wanting to grow and this is it's exciting that it's like the springtime for nashville in a way um so yeah i take on this influence m more as a tempo mm. more as like now i have space and time to really do my art you know there's less distraction i don't have the distraction of like a million restaurants that you could go to mm. like a million venues you could go to there's a lot of possibility in a in metropolis like london paris mm. new york you know in nashville there's limited options. And in a way that frees the creative mind. I think less is more. Is, yeah, again. less is more again, <laughs> back to that. Yeah, maybe I am a bit more of a minimalist than I thought. So where is uh, your home with a big H for you? And yeah. is it Nashville yeah. or do you feel not really connected with a, a place or a, mm. a country or state or whatever? Yeah, maybe I'm, uh, I'm more like a Mongolian nomad. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it could be like that. Um, yeah, if I had a horse, I would probably <laughs> do music know. on horse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it seems like I like to move. Mm. When, when people starting doing music in the pop 
music, uh, let's say, area from whatever it is, a soul, rock and roll, or whatever, they start doing it when they're very young. Mm -hmm. And it's about because they're young, they're doing this. And then after they're growing up and aging and all that. Yeah. Uh, how do you see your evolution in, in your musical path? I mean, from that, you're starting music young and then suddenly you, there's an evolution. Yeah, Have yeah. you been tempted at a certain time like to stop or to switch or whatever, or you just felt your uh, natural musical evolution? Yeah, I mean, I, I just feel like, like I say, I feel like a student in so many levels, uh, in recording, in mixing, in like producing now. Like I've, I've started to turn my hand to producing other artists, which is really, I was nervous to do it. I didn't know if I could do that, if I could transfer what I think, which is a very particular thing, if that would be useful to another artist or if it would get in the way, you know, if I would be too you know, opinionated about how it should be and all this. But it worked really well with the people that I work with. So I'm definitely interested in moving into that. And I mean, I, I just feel like I've, I've only just begun in terms of understanding how to make productions and how sound really behaves. And, you know, there's so many levels to it. It's a, it's a very complicated thing, actually. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautifully infinite thing. Mm. It's not like I can see the end of sound or my fascination with it, you know. Mm. So until um, I'm completely bored of it, then uh, I think I'll just keep exploring it in whichever way feels you know, natural and, and, and mm. fun. And, you know, as I, that's all I... And I'm not, you know, although I have some popularity, I've never been like a huge artist on a major label, you know, with a very definite plan and, you know, it's all very like... Dig, dig, dig. You know, I'm making music because I love it. I'm on an independent label, you know. I've always been quite an underdog in a way, like kind of just under the surface a little bit, cruising. So I'm just kind of, I'm just cruising, man, just gliding. Is it important for you to be on a label like Warp, which is uh, more connected with like electronic music, even if there's some like little electronic yeah. element in your music, but mm -hmm. you're a little bit like a, a UFO in a, an UFO in, a, in when you look at the full catalog of Warp. Yeah. So uh, is it healthy for you in a way that to be in such a label? I think it is. I, I, I think, I mean, I've been with them since 1999 and I've released, yeah, different kinds of material. I think my first record was very abstract and mm. very electronic. And I think people who listen to Jim and who buy modeling gear are like completely confused. Mm. They can't believe probably that it's the same person, you know, and fair enough. Um, but it is, and that's the thing. So my, I, and on this record, I mean, I would say like 90% of the sounds are electronic, you know? Mm. Maybe 80, because of the voice. Mm. Uh, let's call it 70, mm. just to be safe. Uh, but you know, um, that's fairly large. And that's mm. as, probably as large as Battles, mm. or you know, Dark Star, or um, it's more than Grizzly Bear, <laughs> you know? So I mean, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle of the catalog somehow. Mm. With this album, at least. <laughs> you, you were born in the 70s, and how the big two movement, musical movement of uh, 70s, 80s, like uh, hip hop and punk music, affect or did not affect you when you were like a, a kid? Yeah, I mean, uh, my experience of hip hop was very limited growing up. It didn't touch you at that time? When took, you were listening to it? Yeah, I mean, it took me a while, you know. Mm. It took me a while to understand and get the good stuff. And it took me till the 90s, you know. I think uh, I didn't, I felt it, but I felt more like breakdance. And that was more important to me in a way. Not breaking, because I was never that good at it. But uh, I had a go, everyone had a go, you know. I had a BMX, I was part of the whole thing, man. I mean, I, I was a kid in the 80s. So, um, yeah, that was a huge thing to me, Herbie Hancock, Rocket, Rocket. you know all the break-in, the Rocksteady crew, all of that. And it's true, Blondie and the punk the crossover and like, you know, Rapper's nice Delight style. and all of that stuff was, was beautiful, you know, and you got a taste of it. But I was listening to the radio, you know, pop radio. So you only get a superficial understanding of really like hip hop culture from that, you know. Mm. Very, so it took a lot longer for me to find the good stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, punk as well, punk, I, Punk I really ever felt like in the mainstream version because although I saw punks a lot when I would go to London, I lived yeah. close to London, I was quite intimidated by them, you know? I didn't really understand, like, go to Camden, they just looked tough and looked quite aggressive, you know? 
my version of my experience of punk is actually through acid house you know that's kind of what is my punk, punk. it was kind of like another kind of punk revolution but much more generous one i think yeah. it was much more about ecstasy and love and yeah. you know it wasn't so um, aggressive somehow when did you switch to from being like a, a music fan to a musician i mean doing your own stuff mm. and trying to to say what you wanted to say yeah i mean it was a slow evolution actually i i, I kind of had equipment and well, i made music since i was a kid and you know, did things and you know lightly would play in little bands at school and we had ambition actually we would always hang out at lunchtime with the guitars and play and you know we were we knew we were like the musician kids but um i mean we weren't cool but we we wanted to be cool <laughs> you know and then um But it was hard to be cool where I grew up, you know. It wasn't really an option. You just had to invent cool. And I think that's why Prince really appealed to me because he belonged to another place, you know. He didn't belong to the superficial world of Cambridgeshire, where I came from, you know, where everyone was really narrow-minded and like, you know, you could. it's hard to explode and dream in a place like that. You know, you feel people are on the treadmill of life, like they're going to turn into little robots, you know, if they don't w watch out, you know. So I was really determined to be against that you know so i became a kind of a lonely kid in a way because i was i could see everyone else like on another path and i was like i don't want that i, I could dream of something else you know um but yeah so music just became my escape in a way from all of that and uh, i started to make music with machines when i was about 16 i bought a sample on my first keyboard i played a show with the prodigy when i was 17 in the peterborough ice rink i had no idea what kind of music i was making I was I was making some kind of hardcore. It was like samples and breaks, and like samples from all kinds of you know novelty shit like Muppet Show and like you know, it could have been huge. <laughs> you know that could have been like Klingons on the starboard bow. You know that could have been like a number one hit if I'd known the KLF back in those days. I had them hallmarks of some serious novelty but rave, but but you know I evolved into listening to more electronic music and slowly realizing that after I left college, I went to study philosophy and I'd do a proper life, you know, maybe become a philosopher. No, actually I was studying physics. Then I finished in philosophy and then uh, I thought I was still doing music as a hobby, you know, in my bedroom, making techno, making electronic stuff. And, um, and then I sent some to a friend of mine who was working in a big studio in London. He said, oh, your stuff is great, man. You should come in and I won't play it to my boss. So he played my music to another guy that he knew. He liked the sound of it. I came down, I did some recording. We released one 12 inch. And then I met some other guys making techno. Then I made more techno. And then we released 10 records in one year. It became quite a little thing. Then I met Christian Vogel. We did Super Collider. Then I moved to Berlin. I signed to Warp Records, you know. It just happened like a crazy flow. And in a way, I just ended up here. And I just was always just following it like a, like a stream, you know. Did you think that you have always been through to yourself musically during all this huge uh, river of, of music or there are certain times you you were in the stream and you didn't really yeah. knew exactly what happened or definitely sometimes I mean I mean I always feel like I put a lot I never like turn off my brain and just mm -hmm. go oh yeah cool yeah whatever I'm mm -hmm. always super involved in every production There's never been one where I've had a producer that's just done all the work and I just come in and sing my song and go, great. I write the songs, I record them, you know, I, most of the time I help, I either mix them or I, I'm really there for every mix and master as well. So it's like every part of the process I've always been really involved with. Mm. I think that's, that's the way I want it, you know. I mean, sometimes I think w when I was doing the gym campaign, I definitely was trying to chase something. I had more of a motive in mind, you know. I had some kind of end point in my mind. And I think that can actually be a bit dangerous, you know, because you do, you let go of a purity in your output and you start to think more in terms of like strategy, you know, who your brand is, what you're trying to do. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's an interesting balance you have to find to mix art with commerce. And, uh, you know, everyone has to battle with that. So um, I'm not, you know, naive mm. to that. But at the same time, I try to, uh, yeah, I try to make music that I love and, and communicate with it, you know. How did you deal with your idols? You mentioned Prince, for example, which was a big uh, obsession, you said, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, when you're doing music and you have to deal with that. Uh, so 
Who was it? When I met him. No, I mean, yeah, not only, I mean, no, I mean, when you, when you just met his music. Yeah. And it, and it has a, such an impact that, uh, like, being from being a fan to doing your own stuff and not just, like, uh, copying or being too much influenced. Yeah. And try to, to cut uh, the link between... Uh, yeah, it's true, you're right. I mean, in the beginning, when I started to make music, I was like, how do they do it, you know? Mm. How the hell does, do people make these things? Mm. <laughs> how do you make a melody? Like, even simple stuff, I'd sit with a guitar and I'd be like, I don't, what's going on? You know, uh, like it was just, do you make a note go high and then make one go low and then mm. make a long note? And is it like just random or, you know? It was, the whole thing was like a complete mystery to me. And I think, uh, I think it just happened kind of naturally that I or kind of had always a fascination with kind of, I was kind of, a, I'm kind of like a jazz head, really. You know what I mean? Like the way I think about music, the way I sing, the way I create, create stuff, it's kind of like from that world of improvisation. So. It started just to be about that and just playing with it and just like, you know, doing it a lot, you know? And before I knew it, I was making my own stuff mm. and having opinions like, oh, it could be better, you know, we'll try like this. And yeah, evolving my own techniques, my own style. And you're right. And then you leave the stabilizers of your idols behind and they help you to reach a certain point by, you know, showing you some really cool, like, combinations and, you know, like, flavors you know i'm still influenced and i understand those things a lot more now so when i listen to a prince record now i'm older i hear so many different things to the sort of things i was hearing when i was younger hmm. it's like i've lost some innocence but at the same time i've gained some real respect and understanding and and like you know it's it's, it's cool I, i've never stopped being a fan you know especially if prince between 1981 and 1987 it's like a flawless hmm world of output for me i just love it it's uh, it's awesome it's it, it's still it's an amazing rich kind of world you mentioned a lot of instruments but we there's one instrument we haven't mentioned it's your voice your amazing yeah. voice uh when did you realize that you uh, you had this gift in a way and i think yeah i think it was well thank you uh i don't really ever I mean, it's true. My wife has always reminded me of that when I'm complaining about shit. She's like, look, you've got this gift of a voice, so shut up. You know, you, a lot of people would love to have a mm -hmm. voice, you know, and you've got one. So let's, you know, let's use it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like that in a way sometimes. It's like, oh yeah, weird. I've got this voice thing. You know, it's kind of almost like I don't really think about it. But um, when I was a kid, um, it was obviously something you know being a bit old and seeing everyone having babies and like looking at the way that they're very needy and like they need a lot of you know encouragement and love like um me singing as a as a young boy was clearly something that got my parents like like oh yeah you know got them smiling mm. and like got and my parents now i know them better as i'm older they're quite critical actually so it would have if i'd have been a bad singer they probably would have like told me to shut up after a while you know so I think that I think just by like having encouraging parents really my mum especially she's a singer and that kind of environment is what made it happen mm. to be honest it's like that it's like I think it's, it's mostly from the family for me mm. just like um, singing was a natural thing not with my dad's side you know my, if I'd grown up with my dad it probably wouldn't have ever happened but with my, mom, with my mom, like music was just a real natural thing, you know. Mm. I just wanted to be doing stuff that made her proud in a way in the beginning. And then, like you say, you lose that and you want to do it for yourself. Mm. But in the beginning, it's really important, obviously. I think it's mm. huge. You said uh, less is more, even as a listener, that you didn't like to listen to a lot of stuff, but just on a full album, etc. Is it still the same now? What are the stuff you're listening to? And how do you listen to music? I mean, do you mm. always have a headphone on your... Yeah. Like when you're on your plane or not that much? No, I, that's really weird actually. I, I don't know why. I, I mean, sometimes we walked into a cafe the other day and it, they were playing really awful kind of like uh, lounge sound like Dido or something, you know? And that really depresses me, that kind of music. Like I, I can't handle it. It really brings me down. Like it's like the world is really grey and like mm. just hear these endless beats like in a bloody, you know, airport lounge or something, you know, it drives me insane. And like the difference between playing that and you go to a cafe and they're playing Otis Redding or like they're playing, you know, 
just anything like some real sweet old soul and stuff with some human passion behind it you know the room is transformed into this cool place even if it's an ugly place it's just like the music is so powerful to me it can pollute an environment or it can completely you know lift it so i should surround my own environment with much more music i mean i do i listen to a lot of uh, os mutantes mm -hmm. and um uh, at home uh, i still listen to um, a lot of can and um uh, really into Kendrick Lamar at the moment. I listen to him a lot with my wife. Well, she's really into hip hop, so we listen to Gucci Mane and like um, Lil Wayne and <laughs> a lot of heavy shit, which I really like. I like the beats, you know. I like Tonight. I like the Hudson Mohawk thing. I know those guys a little bit, and um, I like some of that trap. Mm. Just a little little taste, mm. you know. Too much, I get a little bored. But you know, that's the thing. I, I'm kind of all over the map. I, mm. I need a fix. So I mean, like for example, I need a I need a real deep jazz fix. I can feel it coming on, you know. So I probably will. I'll go back to you know, a Monk and Coltrane and the classics, and swim in some of that real spiritual shit for a bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And get some Sam Cooke on, and you know, I just kind of I do go in waves, but I'm not like obsessively listening to sound. Yeah. I mean, in the car we listen to a lot of music. And in Nashville, we have this great black radio station, all R&B and amazing old songs. Like they're always playing like Atomic Dog and Cameo and Gap Band and D Train and all you know, stuff. Yeah, stuff you know, it's kind the of the influenced, the influenced my album a lot. You mm. know, they play straight up Bobby Brown. You know, and it's like stuff is banging, man. There's some people talking about how Bobby Brown ain't cool and like New Jack Swing. I mean, they can suck my cock. You know what I mean? Mm. That is banging music. It's like that is hot pop. You know, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but sometimes time, so time has to go yeah. into a music to be reevaluated. Yeah, whatever. yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's true. I mean, uh, it's just all opinions, man. People just, uh, people just, you know. But Frank Ocean and those guys, they're great, man. I really like that Pink Matter mm. song with Andre, mm. three south, three thousand, and uh, there's one with Big Boy on it, like a little naughty mix because i think they're not supposed to be on the same release or something mm -hmm. and that's that's beautiful man i mean i, mean, I miss outcast you know mm -hmm. love outcast and uh yeah there's there's and, and i like um azalea banks and there's some cool i really like that i mean machine drum is a really cool producer who works with her sometimes and mm -hmm. you know i'm open how do you see the evolution of uh soul music since the last years. I mean, you mentioned like Frank Ocean, there's like stuff yeah. like, I don't know, The Weeknd or mm -hmm. Ink or more like vintage stuff like uh, Daptones, etc. Yeah, right. To uh, even Emmy Winehouse and whatever. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, it seems like the the soul scene is uh, much uh, wider and there's different flavors, even yeah. you and all that. I mean, how do you see all this evolution in the last years? It's uh, healthy, you think? Yeah, I think it's healthy, you yeah. know. Mm. I mean, I think for a long time, the indie music scene, you know, was dominated by guitars and stuff still, you know? And I think if you try to, like, add a little soul on top of that, it was always a bit like, nah, that's the step too far, you know? But now I think the palette is much more open, you know? And I, it, that, that's really, I, I welcome it. You know, I'm really, I'm always really happy to hear hear that kind of mix obviously that's kind of where i'm coming from mm. so yeah i mean all of that stuff is great i mean um i had the pleasure to like share the stage with you know sharon jones a few times and she's a ball of energy man you can't you can't mess with sharon jones you know she's mm. incredible she's the real deal and uh, the daptones are an amazing band mm. so world class and and it's just you know i think it's a it's really you know, we're in a good time for music, I think. A lot of, I think a lot of people worry that music is like dying or some, you know, they have this tragic vision of apocalyptic, like what's left, you know. But there's so much good stuff and it's evolving in a really cool way. People like Kendrick Lamar as well, you know. There's like a really great new talent on the horizon. He's already here, but I mean, you know, what he can do in the future, I think is really, it's, it's an exciting prospect, you know. Mm. and. Uh, you know, Dre's still around, still wants to do good stuff. I mean, you know, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> I bring on the soul as well, you know, totally. Last question. 
your favorite Prince song? I mean, there's a lot, man. Uh, it does. The one of today. Yeah, <laughs> I think When Doves Cry. Mm. It's banging. It's okay. utter joy. It's insane. Yeah, makes me happy. Makes me cry like a dove. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jimmy. Thanks, man.